I'm very concerned. Canada's entanglement with communist China under Justin Trudeau is worse than anyone could have imagined. Yesterday, we saw an access to information request shared in the media. These documents are typically heavily redacted, but a government error revealed shocking details. Global Affairs Canada, under influence from the Trudeau Liberals, has been pressuring Canada's military to join exercises and to cooperate with the communist Chinese military in Canada, the People's Liberation Army being trained by the Canadian military in Canada. Les médias ont révélé hier que des responsables du ministre des Affaires étrangères ont fait pression sur nos forces armées pour qu'elles fassent des exercices conjoints avec l'armée chinoise. Cela montre un degré de naïveté dangereux du gouvernement Trudeau. Après un partenariat pour un vaccin avec la Chine, qui a probablement mené à un vol de notre propriété intellectuelle, voilà que le gouvernement Trudeau fait des pressions dangereuses sur nos militaires en faveur de la Chine. Mr. Trudeau has ignored the vice of our military and our allies for years on China. Last week, we learned how the Liberals' dangerous approach has hurt Canada's vaccine plans. The Liberals were warned of the dangers of sharing vaccine information with China. And this week, we are learning our military and allies warned them again of the dangers of sharing military knowledge with China. But it seems the Liberals will never listen. They think they know better than our military and our scientific experts. This dangerously naive approach has put Canada and our citizens at risk time and time again. Today is the sad anniversary of the illegal abduction and imprisonment of two innocent Canadians in China. For months, China has unfairly targeted our farming exports. For years, the, the Chinese Communist Party has been carrying out mass internment of the Uyghurs in concentration camps, and still the Liberals keep pushing for more involvement and more engagement with China. We now know from media reports that the Liberal government tried to hide that and that they would hide their direction from Canadians even though it would risk public safety and security. Our military wanted to end joint exercises with China because of the theft of intellectual property, cyber espionage, and influence operations that are not an occasional occurrence with China. Sadly, they are the norm. Let me be perfectly clear. China does not act like a partner or a friend. In fact, communist China acts against human rights and the rule of law consistently. To learn that the Trudeau cabinet is kowtowing to Beijing is frankly disturbing. This highlights the Liberals' approach and their dangerous approach to China. From the Prime Minister's party fundraising with United Front oper operatives to the many Liberal leaders advocating for Chinese business interests, this government always seems to put corporate interests ahead of human rights and the Canadian national interest. Après tout ce qui on sait à propos de la Chine, de sa corruption, à son incarcération des Uyghurs et Tibétains, il y a encore de nombreux libéraux qui se portent à la défense de ce régime. Les Canadiens doivent se méfier des élites que leur demandent toujours plus d'intégration avec un pays qui ne respecte Pas notre démocratie. It is time for the Trudeau government to stop the dangerous influence of Chinese money and operatives in Canada. The government's new framework with respect to communist China needs to be implemented now. The government needs to wake up. Prime Minister Trudeau's naive approach to China must stop now. Thank you very much. And we'll now take questions, starting with question on the phone. As usual, one question, one follow-up per reporter. Nous allons maintenant prendre les questions, commençant par les questions au téléphone. Un petit rappel, uh, toujours une question, une question suivie par journaliste. Opérateur, avons-nous une première question? 
Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. La première question, the first question is from Christian Noël, Radio-Canada. Please go ahead, your line is open. Votre ligne est ouverte. Bonjour, M. O'Toole. Um, il y a quand même des gens d'affaires qui, euh, parfois, votre conservateur, qui voudraient quand même continuer de faire affaire avec la Chine parce qu'il y a des opportunités de marché. Qu'est-ce que vous dites aux gens d'affaires qui votent conservateurs, qui, eux, veulent continuer de faire affaire avec la Chine parce que ça rapporte de l'argent? Merci pour la question, Christian. C'est une question importante parce qu'il y a beaucoup d'opportunités avec la Chine pour, pour les entreprises. Mais on, on doit examiner le bilan de la Chine avec les droits des personnes, avec un manque de respect pour, pour l'ordre international, pour le commerce international. Et c'est le temps d'avoir une approche sérieuse par le gouvernement canadien et en même temps de, de travailler avec nos entreprises sur les intérêts canadiens. Et quelquefois, il y a des, des opportunités, des affaires, mais on doit avoir une approche de principe pour défendre nos citoyens, notre sécurité et les intérêts de nos alliés. Donc, c'est un temps pour un reset avec nos relations avec la Chine. Pour aider la libération des deux Michael, vous, vous feriez quoi? Est-ce que vous échangeriez euh, les deux Michael contre, Meng, contre la liberté de Meng Wanzhou, par exemple? Qu'est-ce que vous êtes prêt à faire que le gouvernement... Et d'utiliser les sanctions Megninsky contre quelques dirigeants chinois. Uh, ça serait une approche de principe uh, et un, une approche en commun avec nos alliés. Uh, L'Union européenne vient de passer leurs sanctions Magninsky. Les États-Unis ont utilisé quelques fois. C'est le temps de, pour, pour le Canada d'utiliser les sanctions Magninsky contre quelques dirigeants chinois uh, et de collaborer avec nos alliés comme l'Australie aussi. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question, the next question is from Lina Dib, la presse canadienne. Please go ahead, your line is open. Votre ligne est ouverte. Bonjour, M. O'Toole. Moi, j'aimerais revenir sur l'aide médicale à mourir. Euh, le Bloc québécois semble dire que vous allez avoir un prix politique à payer. C'est peut-être aussi le calcul que font les libéraux en vous laissant parler euh, en chambre euh, sur, sur C7. Alors, je voudrais savoir, vous, quel calcul vous faites sur ce que ça va vous coûter politiquement au Québec euh, de retarder ou peut-être même d'empêcher de, l'adoption de C7? Nous sommes ici proches d'une date limite à cause d'inaction du gouvernement Trudeau avec la prorogation du Parlement, avec un délai. On a des, des questions raisonnables pour les plus vulnérables dans notre société, les handicapés, les, les aînés. Et nous sommes avec quelques dirigeants autochtones et des, des leaders dans le, la communauté des handicapés, d'avoir des amendements raisonnables euh, avec ces sept. Et on a la même position de l'ancien euh, euh, ministre de la Justice euh, libéral, Mme Wilson-Raybould. Donc, il y a beaucoup de voix sur cet enjeu et c'est le temps euh, pour le ministre Lametti d'avoir une approche de respect pour les handicapés, pour nos aînés, particulièrement en plein d'une pandémie. D'accord, mais je reviens sur la question du, du prix politique à payer. Est-ce que vous considérez qu'il n'y en aura pas de prix politique, que ça ne vous coûtera rien? Euh, hier, c'était le 23e député conservateur qui se levait en troisième lecture pour répéter les choses qui y ont déjà été dites par les vôtres en deuxième lecture, en comité. Vous croyez que ça ne va rien vous coûter au Québec, ça, politiquement, en termes de vote? J'espère que non. Pour les précautions, on a besoin seulement des précautions comme une pause de, de, de 10 jours, euh, c est, c est, ça serait une approche importante. Et c'est la même chose que le, la Cour suprême a dit avec la cas Carter. C'est important d'avoir les précautions pour les plus vulnérables dans notre société. Euh, 
j'étais déçu par l'approche du Bloc québécois, euh, sans de respect pour les handicapés, pas, sans, pas de respect pour nos aînés, particulièrement après les, euh, la situation grave dans les CHSLD au Québec. C'est le temps de, pour les Blocs québécois d'avoir une approche sérieuse sur les, sur les enjeux sérieux. Opérateur, prochaine question. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question, the next question is from Helen Buzetti, Le Devoir. Please go ahead, your line is open. Votre ligne est ouverte. Oui. Bonjour, M. O'Toole. Moi, j'aimerais revenir sur la question des transferts euh, en santé aux provinces. Vous avez dit dans le passé que vous, si vous étiez au pouvoir, vous prévoiriez des transferts stables et prévisibles. Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire exactement? Merci, Hélène. Stable, prévisible et sans condition. C'est une approche euh, avec beaucoup de collaboration avec les provinces. Ce pas une approche de confrontation. Euh, J'ai dit ça avec le premier ministre Legault en septembre. On a parlé sur les transferts en santé. Je vais augmenter euh, en, dans une manière juste. Et malheureusement, M. Trudeau a toujours une approche de « Ottawa knows best » sur les transferts en santé sur la situation dans les CHSLD et les résidences pour aînés. Euh, on doit collaborer en plein de pandémie et, et, et pas d'avoir des confrontations. Alors, vous dites une augmentation juste. Les provinces demandent une augmentation de 28 milliards, 67 dès cette année et ensuite un 6 euh, annuel d'augmentation. Vous, seriez-vous d'accord pour donner 28 milliards d'un coup aux provinces euh, si vous étiez premier ministre? Merci. Pour moi, ce n'est pas le montant, c'est l'approche. Et je vais, comme j'ai dit, je vais avoir une approche de collaboration et sans condition, parce que c'est les provinces qui sont en charge de, de les hôpitaux, de les résidences pour aînés, et particulièrement si les provinces qui ont pris des leçons après la première vague, pas des fonctionnaires à, à Ottawa. C'est inacceptable pour M. Trudeau d'avoir une approche uh, comme ça avec les transferts en santé. We will now take questions in the room. Nous allons maintenant prendre des questions dans la salle. David? Hi. Good morning, Mr. Tool. David Thornton, CBC News. Given that we're running out of time when it comes to the bill before Parliament on medical assistance in dying, what do you think the government's best option should be at this point? Maybe have the House and perhaps work with the Senate to sit a bit longer to get this done before the deadline? Or what other measures are you recommending that the government adopt? Great question, David. The reason we're in this time crunch right now is entirely in the hands of Mr. Trudeau. They chose first not to appeal a superior court decision in Quebec. The Carter decision, the last major decision uh, on medical assistance in dying, was a Supreme Court decision. This should have been appealed. All legal experts say that this case should have been appealed. But more importantly, Mr. Trudeau prorogued Parliament and then had to reset all legislation. That lost two months. So if we're close to a timeline here, it's because of Mr. Trudeau's inability to answer a few questions on the Wee scandal, and that has led to a cascading delay in legislation. We just have some reasonable amendments to protect uh, people with disabilities, uh, seniors who feel vulnerable. There's hundreds of witnesses, legal experts, Uh, a Liberal MP, I think one of the only physicians in Mr. Trudeau's caucus, is a voting against his bill because there's no safeguards. Minister Lametti, listen to some of our most vulnerable, put in the safeguards, and we can finalize this bill. And of course, uh, the Prime Minister is meeting with uh, the Premiers today. I'm just wondering, uh, again, I'll ask, what are you hoping that will come from this meeting? I hope to see... Uh, an approach from Mr. Trudeau of collaboration. As I've said, the, the provinces have done yeoman service trying to uh, ramp up their healthcare systems, address issues in long-term care and seniors' residences. The last thing we need is Mr. Trudeau, who is not connected to, to any of the provincial systems, to dictate how they should operate. 
there should be funding in a way that doesn't have conditions, that's predictable, that is fair to the provinces. I know the provinces are united on that, so I hope Mr. Trudeau respects that. That's what a leader should do. And we'll now go back on the phone for the last questions. Uh, Barrier, do we have a next question? Thank you. Merci. The next question, la prochaine question is from Cormac McSweeney, City News. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Votre ligne est ouverte. Yes, Mr. O'Toole, I just wanted to ask you a question that you were asked earlier in French, but I want to get to on it in English. Um, what would you have done differently to deal with China that would have left Canada in a better situation than it is now in terms of the uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver case? I would have been dealing with China with eyes wide open from day one. Mr. Trudeau has been dangerously naive. Those are words of some of our former diplomats who've said that, and his close associations with the fundraising, the transition team, has him out of step with the reality of China. Even two years ago, when the two Michaels were first, uh, were first taken hostage, he called them regular consular cases. We knew that these weren't regular consular cases. We knew that this was diplomatic hostage taking, and we said that should have been taken more seriously from the start. We remember his minister, his hand-picked Mr. McCallum, contradicting himself, also trying to, to kowtow to Beijing, we would have uh, looked to work with the United States and other countries on a Magnitsky sanction approach. We, we want to resolve disputes with China, but we have to show we're serious, we're willing to stand up for our citizens and our values. And uh, just as a follow-up, I want to get your direct reaction to the news this morning uh, that uh, officials in Beijing have said that Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver have already been indicted and tried. And then um, just as a follow-up to your answer there, uh, don't you think that sanctions at a time like this would put them at even greater risk uh, given the situation that uh, Kovrig and Spaver are in? No. Two years of inaction and kowtowing by the Trudeau government has led to, as you said, Cormac, the the trial, there is no justice system in China, the, the show trial, uh, the indictment of two citizens, uh, a weak and timid approach has failed. It is time to work with our allies and show that we're going to have a more serious approach with respect to Beijing. I know that that will have a more serious impact than the two years of waffling under Mr. Trudeau. Beijing thinks the Trudeau government is weak, and he proves them right at every step. So working with countries like Australia, who has more at risk with respect to, to China, and, and the United States, we must show a united front of, of democratic countries that will say this type of conduct in terms of diplomatic hostage taking, in terms of the police state in Hong Kong, with respect to the internment of Uyghurs on the cover of the Globe and Mail today, we cannot turn a blind eye to the reality of communist China. It's time for Prime Minister Trudeau to wake up. And the last question will also be on the phone. The last question will also be on the telephone. Operator, we have the next question. Thank you. Merci. The next question, the next question is from Mike Blanchfield, Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Your line is open. Yeah, hi, Mr. O'Toole. Again, uh, nice to hear from you again. Um, I just want to follow up on Cormac's question. Um, I mean, I, I, we take your point and we're clear on your position, but uh, uh, Michael Kovrig's employer, the International Crisis Group, which deals you know, with security threats around the world, they say the government is doing everything it can to reasonably get these guys out. So, I mean, I, we take your points, obviously. You think they could have done more, done it differently. But um, don't you think that some of the, um, you know, some of what you might be advocating, Magnits Magnitsky sanctions, uh, perhaps well-intentioned, um, you know, could have negative repercussions for these two Michaels um, because, uh, you know, when you, poke, uh, when you poke the jailer in the eye, uh, it's not always a good idea. Do you not think that's a consideration? Or can you talk about that a little bit more in, in a little more detail, perhaps? Well, if you look, we didn't have an ambassador in Beijing for the better part of a year because of Mr. Trudeau's hand-picked liberal insider, John McCallum. Um, so to suggest that this has been handled well over the last two years is fantasy. Um, we, we didn't have a diplomat in that country when we were seeing our citizens detained. We were seeing citizens harassed. We remember two years ago the school teacher from Alberta 
Uh, there's dozens of other cases like this. And of course, our canola and other exports that were being held hostage as well. So we haven't had a serious and professional approach. The fact that Mr. Trudeau compared their cases to regular consular cases meant he was trying to mislead Canadians right from the start on the gravity of the situation for the two Michaels. There's also been Mr. Schellenberg and, and other Canadians who've had uh, prison sentences changed to death as part of, of this coordinated pressure approach from China. We have to show that we're willing to stand up for our interests, our citizens, and our values, sometimes with tough and difficult decisions, like sanctions. But inaction and weakness has not worked, Mike. And I think this is where working with Australia, who's been much more assertive, they're in the sphere of influence of China and have a free trade agreement with China, and they're showing more courage with respect to a principled diplomatic approach. Um, it's time for Mr. Trudeau to get serious, and the so-called new framework they've talked about for months, it needs to be implemented now. Where do you stand on uh, the government uh, dealing with the Biden administration and perhaps uh, persuading them to um, withdraw the charges against Ming? I mean, that would obviously create uh, a ripple effect that might get the two Michaels out. Uh, do you think this should be actively pursued? Do you think that that would be kowtowing to China if... Uh, the U.S. suddenly withdrew a prosecution because they just, maybe they decided, oh, it's not a strong case or whatever legal calculation they make. What's your comment on that? Well, when I asked for a phone call with the Prime Minister two weeks ago, and we remember the, the various readouts, and that, that was the most coverage of that, of that phone call, part of it was I said we needed to work with the incoming administration with respect to concerns on China. In fact, the Obama administration and, and Vice President Biden were the first to tariff Chinese steel, for example. The Biden-Obama administration was the first to, to talk about concerns about Huawei in the 5G, the concern about Mr. Trudeau reversing the decision with respect to the ONET transaction. So the Pentagon, the State Department, under Mr. Biden as vice president, viewed the Trudeau government as weak, as a Five Eyes ally. So we should actually coordinate issues on trade and Five Eyes security with the U.S. So I recommended a bit of a fresh start with, with Mr. Trudeau and, and the Biden administration. And if, if the Conservatives form government, we will be much more strategic linking trade and security like the U.S. does and working with Five Eyes allies, Australia, the United Kingdom, New Zealand. We are the only country, Mike, as you know, that is still considering Huawei as part of our 5G. Mr. Trudeau has one more week to respect the motion of Parliament with respect to the, the Huawei decision. And this concludes the press conference. This is the Mechanical Thank you very much.